Hey guys, Frosty Nice here, back with another book review. And today we are going to be reviewing uh, my all-time favorite Stephen King book, and one that has been requested. We are going to be taking a look at Stephen King's It. Normally I reread the books before I do the reviews, but I've read this about a dozen times since it's come out, so... Um, I feel I, I I don't need to do that. I might read it for fun, but um, I don't need to reread it for the purpose of this review. So this is, um, as far as his standalone novels are concerned, I, I really believe this is his magnum opus. I really believe that this is probably the single, this is the best single novel that Stephen King has, has ever written. Um... This book was published in 1986, and the paperback clocks in at 1,093 pages. Um, it's not the longest book he's ever written. That is still The Stand at over 1,100 pages, uh, but this is the second longest book that he's written. Um, under the Dome came in 1,000 pages, but it came in under this one, so um, that would be the third longest book. This is the second longest book he wrote, and he and I read this first when it came out in 1986. Um, so let's talk about all of the things that I like about this book. Let's talk about all the things that are that are good. There's very little, I think. There's very little that's not good in this book. There's very little that's wrong. And every time I read it, even though I've read it about a dozen times, I get something new out of it. Um, First of all, when I read this for the first time, I wasn't much older than the kids in this story. So that made them instantly relatable to me. I could relate to every single person, every single character in this, in this book. Um, so let's talk about the characters for a minute. Because the characters in this book are amazing. Um, they're just such rich characters. And for someone of King's age at the time when he wrote it to be so far out of childhood, of, of the childhood years, to be able to capture children, you know, the way children are so well in this book is, is pretty amazing. So there are seven kids that band together to form it. First of all, I'll just give you the quick synopsis. You probably already know it already. Seven kids in 1957 stumble upon a shape-shifting creature that lives in the sewers of Derry, Maine, that is killing children and eating them. They band together to, to try to stop it and to kill it. And they make a promise that if it ever comes back, they will come back to finish the job. 30 years later, they come back as adults because it comes back and they proceed to fight it and finally kill it um, for real as, as adults. There's the quick and dirty synopsis. So let's talk about the characters. Um, you have Bill Denbro, stuttering Bill Denbro, who is the de facto leader of the group. And uh, he's the leader because his brother Georgie was the first child in the 1957 cycle of murders. He was the first one to get killed. His arm was ripped off and eaten by Pennywise. His arm was ripped off in a sewer. Um, so um, he's the first one. He's the one that has the most personal uh, attachment to, to killing it. He's the one that's going to kill it. He's going after it whether his friends want to help him or not. And he has a stutter. Um, so because he has a stutter... That makes him a target of bullies. Um, so he's bullied because of that. And he's bullied because his brother has died. You have Ben Hanscom, um, the obligatory fat kid. He's, he's the fat kid in the book. And he's, again, bullied because of his weight. Um, these are all kids that are bullied at school, at home, or both. Um, so you've got Richie Tozier, the, the scrawny, geeky kid with the glasses. Who, 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 who does impersonations. As a kid, he does impersonations pretty badly. They all sound the same. But as an adult, he becomes a really successful DJ who can do impersonations. They, he's known as the man of a thousand voices on the radio. Um, so because he's geeky and he's a class clown, and he wears glasses, you know, again, target for bullies. Eddie Kasprak. Eddie Kasprak um, he is the victim of a very, very overbearing mother. Eddie Cashback is actually, they don't really mention it. Or they might mention it in the book, but Eddie is the victim of Munchausen's syndrome. Um, 
Eddie's mother has convinced him that he's sick. He's sick all the time. He's convinced him that he has asthma and that he can't do things. Eddie doesn't actually have asthma. The doctor gave him a placebo, a, a placebo inhaler filled with water and camphor to make it taste like medicine. But Eddie doesn't have asthma. Eddie doesn't get sick. Eddie gets sick, but that's just because his mother makes him sick. So she keeps telling him he's frail and that he 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 has to take he can't do all of these things because he's this frail and sickly child. So he's really a victim of his overbearing mother. Um, you got Stanley Uris, who is Jewish. And because he's Jewish in 1957, small town Maine, he's a target of bullies, simply because he's Jewish. Mike Hanlon um, is black. I think he might be the only black kid in Derry, um, or, or one of the few. That there's not a, a large African-American population, but because he's black. Remember, 1957, white, small town Derry, Maine, that makes Mike a target for bullies. Um, and then you have, uh, Beverly Marsh, the only girl in the group. Um, and she's abused uh, at home by her father. Her father abuses her physically and I believe sexually. Um, so she's a victim of parental abuse. So all these pe people have, have, you know, something in common other than it. They both, they all come from sort of broken homes. They're all bullied in school. They all have things that make them outsiders to the norm uh, that's a lot of air quotes to the norm of small town main life so they band together they initially band together because they're running from the bullies and they they group together to make a stand against the bullies that are beating them up in school but then they start to compare stories and they start to talk about it and the things that they see and they get together and they they realize that it is hunting the children and slaughtering them and, 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 and eating them. And they begin to investigate and they start to find out why. And they're the ones that actually unravel uh, the mysteries of what it is. So I can relate to the characters. I could relate to the characters back then. I can still relate to the characters. Sometimes I see myself in some of the characters. I've known kids in school that were like some of the characters in the book. <clears throat> some of my peers, you know, all of the stories of, of these kids in their home lives and their and, and their school lives are very very extremely relatable to me these are king has always done well with characterizations and the characters in this book are so real uh mostly because i can relate to them i've seen them i've had peers stories of her similar stories so um i think that might have been initially what really made me enjoy this book it was about not me, but it was about my demographic, my my age group. It was a story about, it's a story essentially about childhood. It's about the magic of childhood. It's about how children can see things that adults can't. It's about how children accept things that adults can't. It's about how children understand and accept the fact that there are monsters in the world, that there are boogeymen, that there are, there can be zombies and lepers and vampires and werewolves and things that go bump in the night and creatures that hide in your closet and things that live in your basement. Children accept that. They believe that. They, you don't have to convince them that this stuff is real. They believe it. And so this book is really about the magic of childhood and how as you become an adult, you lose that magic. You don't have those fears anymore. You have to convince adults that these things could be real. In horror novels, it's always the adults that you have to convince that the, the monster is real, or the zombie is real, or that the werewolf is real. But with the children, you don't have to explain it to them. You don't have to convince them. You just have to tell, get a bunch of children together and say, hey, you know what, there's zombies in, in this town. We need to fight them. And the children will go, okay, let's do that. We know how to do that. So um, their, their minds is such a fertile ground for imagination, and that's why it hunts them, because... It says that because their imaginations are so young and so fertile, it's so primal that it makes the meat tastier. Their fear is like the spice that makes their flesh tasty. I know it's kind of gross, but since it eats children, it, it, it engenders this fear in them, this primal fear, so that the meal will taste that much sweeter. Um, so... Uh, this takes place in, in, in Derry, Maine. Um, and for those of you who may or may not know, Derry, Maine is actually Bangor. Um, Stephen King took Bangor, Maine, reskinned it, called it Derry, 
So a lot of the stuff that's in this book, like this dairy standpipe, the plastic Paul Bunyan statue um, that's in the park, a lot of the landmarks, a lot of the way that the town is laid out is exactly like Bangor, Maine. Um, Stephen King did a walking tour of Bangor before he wrote it and really got a lay of the land. So we have a really nice in-depth look at Derry, Maine. Um, the, the hit, the, there's, a, there's a, a lot of world building in here, a lot of history building. You learn about the whole history of Maine. I like that. I like reading about a book and, and if it takes place in a world or a town or a kingdom or wherever, I like when an author just world builds and you really get the meat of the town. You can see like the town from inception, how it's grown through the years, the pitfalls, the problems, the violence, everything, the stories, the urban legends that happen. And that, that takes place all in this book. Stephen King lays out Derry from when Derry was actually created as a village to where it takes place now and lays out the roadmap of Derry. And you can really get the sense of what Derry is and how long this evil has been lurking under Derry and how long, <clears throat> excuse me, and how people have, the adults of Derry have known that there were, um, I'm going to put that down, it's a little heavy. How the people of Derry had, have known that the town was sour for years. The people who live in Derry, the adults that live in Derry, who don't want to see it for what it is, they know that the town is sour. They know that things happen. They know that every 30 years, kids disappear. They get murdered. Bad things happen in this town. Race riots, fires, large sections of the population get wiped out. And they know that the town is corrupt. They know that the town is evil, but that's just the way the town is. To them, that's just life in Derry. Life in Derry, and sometimes it's good, and sometimes it's bad. And when it's bad, it's okay, because eventually it'll get good again. And so they turn a blind eye to how Derry really is. They don't want to see the disease beneath Derry. They don't want to admit that, that there's something there, that there's a, a conduit of evil that has been living under Derry for as long as Derry has existed. The children know. The children always know. They know that, 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 that this evil is there, and they accept it. And, and finally, in this book, they, they try to fight it. But the adults, they, they know it's there. Subconsciously, they know it's there. And they know that, that this, the town is just not right, but they don't want to admit it. They don't want to admit that these things exist. They think if they turn a blind eye, it'll go away. And it does go away. It comes back every 30 years, but it goes away eventually. And for 30 years, everybody is happy in Derry. Um, so I like the fact that Stephen King takes the time to world build to that extent in Derry. The other thing I like about the book is that it is essentially, I like the narrative structure. And what I mean by that is this is essentially two books, two stories. It's the stories of the children of, as, as children in 1957. And then it's the story of the children as adults in 1986, 30 years later or so, 1987. So it's, it's two stories of how they fight it as a children and then how they fight it as adults. And for a while, the two stories sort of run parallel to each other. It's told in flashbacks. It's told in, you know, you'll be in 1957 and then there'll be some chapters in 1987. And this, the two stories run in tandem. And, uh, but as they, as they sort of barrel towards the conclusion, as both stories come to the point where um, the children fight it, then the, the narratives start flipping really quickly. And so you'll be reading along and it'll be 1957 and then the next paragraph, boom, you'll be in 1987 and you're following along with the kids going through the same, as adults going through. So that it mirrors each other. This is essentially two stories that mirror each other. And I like that. I don't know if King invented that technique, that's the first time I've ever read that technique in a book. I've never seen anybody prior to it use that technique where they're flipping back and forth between two time periods almost simultaneously. I mean, the end of, of the book, the climactic battle, flips almost paragraph by to paragraph of how the kids fight it. You'll be reading it. You'll be in 1957, boom, 87, boom, 57, and you're just following it along in tandem. And I like that. I like that narrative structure. It's very interesting the way that King wrote the book. Um, there's a lot in this book that didn't make it into the movie, which, just for the record, I hated the made-for-TV series movie. Thank God they're remaking an actual movie of it as rated R, but I hated it. 
there's a lot of things that didn't make it into the movie. There's a lot of conversation that the kids have with it. Specifically, Bill Denbro being the leader. He has a lot of conversations with it. When they finally meet the creature who, you know, looks like a giant spider. It isn't really a giant spider, but that's the only form that their minds can understand. They can't see it in its true form. Their minds won't understand it. So they see it as a giant spider. And Bill and it have to have conversations. There are large chunks at the end of the book where it and Bill are talking, mentally talking in their minds. And um, it's telling Bill, you know, how it's lived forever. And, and that's a lot of where I think the connections to the tower come from. But we're not going to talk about that. Um, how it talks about how it's ancient and how you can't kill it and how... And, and they talk back and forth and they, they cut all that out in the movie. I don't know if they didn't know how to film it. But all the conversations that you get where you learn about the true nature of it and the ex exposition behind the creature um, and, the, and, and the talks that he, it has with, with Bill Denbro. I, I enjoy that. I like that. I like how, you know, I don't always need an explanation of where things come from or why things are the way they are. But I like when authors give us that. And I think that it, I mean, it, King really, he, I mean, he, he swung for the fences with it. He wanted to make something epic. And I think he succeeded um, in, in all levels. It, it, it is a tremendous horror novel. Um, it feels almost like a 1950s horror novel. It's a tremendous world-building novel. There's so much description. So much description of the kids. There's so much description of the town. Um, there's so much action in the book. It's a, over 1,000 a pages long. It's almost 1,100 pages long. But to me, it's a quick read. Because you read it and it just, from the get-go, when the first murders start all the way to the end, it's like a rocket ship. It's like King wrote this in a white haze. You talk, you hear about about authors writing in blind heats and white hazes, and you can tell that I don't know if he was hopped up on drugs when he wrote this, but man, you can tell that he just wrote it and boom took off because that's the way it reads. Um, it reads really, really, just a, a frenzy, and I like that. So if if you've never read it but you're intimidated by the page count. Don't be. I mean, you, you once you start it, I mean, it's going to hook you. And it's going to pull you along. And you are going to read it. And you're going to finish it. And you're going to go, wow, I can't believe I read 1,100 pages that fast. Because it's that good. I know um, it's a long book. And I know that Stephen King is uh, criticized for having word process, diary of the word processor. For being wordy. There, Despite the size of the book, there is very little bloat. In this book, everything in this book is necessary. There is nothing in this book that you can read where you would go, I, I would edit that out. I would edit that out. There's not a lot of bloat in it. Everything in here, I feel, is necessary to the story. There's nothing you could cut out. It, it is all there. It has to be there. The history, the, the, because of the epic nature of the book, it has to be this length. And I don't think he's writing this book just to be wordy. I think... It is the length that it needed to be to tell the story that it wanted to tell. And there are a couple of other things. The only thing that I might wonder about in, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't wonder about it. As an adult, I wonder about it. But um, at the end of the book, when the kids are, are uh, children and uh, they've just finished fighting it and they sort of are trying to get out of the sewers, um, in the movie, Beverly cuts everybody's hands with like a piece of glass and they make a circle and they form like a blood bond um, that says, you know, if this comes back, we'll remember and we'll come back. In the book, she doesn't do that. In the book, she actually sleeps with them. So 12-year-old Beverly Marsh sleeps with every single one, all six of the other guys to sort of make the circle. Um, <clears throat> when I was 12 years old or 14 years old and I read that, it didn't seem weird to me. Um, seems a little weird to me now, maybe because I'm an adult and I've started to lose that magic of childhood. I can see why they didn't put it in the movie. I can see why they say, we're not going to have a little orgy of children in the movie. We're going to have you know them do the, 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 the cut hands and we'll, we'll make the promise. 
But that was in the book. Um, I can kind of see where Stephen King was coming from. In his mind, that was the only thing, that was the most personal thing that Beverly could do to keep the group together, to bind them together. That was the most personal thing she could give to bind the group together. Is it strange? Yeah, it's a, it's a little strange, and it gets a little stranger as I get older and I read it. Um, as a child, when I read it, it didn't seem strange to me, but then again, they were my peers. They were my peers, and so it didn't seem strange to me. As an adult now, it does, it does seem a little weird, but I wonder if that's because I'm older, I have a child, uh, and I don't want to think in that terms anymore, so maybe that's why. I don't necessarily think it should be omitted from the book. I don't think it's something that he should have rewritten. Um, you know, that might be my one and only criticism. And it's not even a criticism. It's just something in the book that is, it seems a little strange the older I get. And it's probably because it's the older I am. Um, but other than that, it is a phenomenal read. I'm going to give this an A plus out of A plus. Read it. You should read it. If nothing else, I know you don't like clowns. You don't want to read about clowns. Um, you don't want to read about things that go bump in the night. Maybe clowns scare you. Um, tough crap. Read it anyway. It is it is a phenomenal, phenomenal read. And there are layers to it. And there are allegories in it. There are metaphors in it. And there are things that you're going to walk away from. Um, but if you like King and you've never read it, shame on you. If you like horror novels and you've never read it, shame on you. You really should read it. Don't just base it on that god-awful movie that came out. That movie is just a pale shadow of what this really is. If you've read the movie and you said, ah, that movie was a piece of crap, good. Because it is a piece of crap. Read the book. I don't think you'll be disappointed. And even if you're not a reader, read the book. You really should just read it. Read it a couple of times. If you don't want to read it, get the audio book. Listen to it, you know? Find an audio book, rent it from your, go to your library or rent it, borrow it or something. Find an audio book version of it and listen to it. Some manner you should consume this story, whether you read it or whether you listen to it. Don't watch the movie because it's awful. But you should really just, this is King at his finest. And when I say this is King at his finest, this is, his swan song. This is his denouement. This is his magnum opus. More so, I think, than The Tower. This is, I think, the single most important book that King has ever written. And I think you should read it. This is going to become the 80s version of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. This is going to become the 80s version of Bram Stoker's Dracula. This is going to be, come a book, and I don't know, I've been a long time since I've out of, been out of college. Maybe they're doing it now. This is a book that people are going to teach out of. This is a book that literature classes are going to teach from. This is The Grapes of Wrath. This is um, the big books that they used to, you know, they teach. At some point, someone's going to teach it in English, in high school English, in college English. It's going to be mandatory reading. I really believe that. If it's not already, it should be. Because there's so much in this book. And really, it's about the magic of childhood really what it is. It is about the magic of being a child. The fertile imagination that is the childhood imagination and how we lose it as adults and the power that the child mind has. I'm going to leave you with a quote. There's a, and this is not a, a word for word quote, but there's a quote in the book that set, talks about how um, there's, a book that talks, there's a quote in the book that talks about how you could take, you know, a thousand villagers could, you know, make up, could, 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 could invent a vampire. Could invent a vampire. A thousand villagers could get together and invent a vampire. But it'll be one, one villager, most likely a child, that will invent the stake that can destroy the vampire. And that's it in a nutshell. Many people can invent evil and come up with evil. But the person that comes up with the method of destroying evil is usually a child. It's all up here. It's all in the fertile imagination. And when you're writers, for people who do write, 
I think they're the lucky ones who are able to keep that fertile imagination going even into adulthood. So guys, that's my review of it. Frosty Knives gives this an A plus 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 read it. Listen to it. But in some way, shape, or form, you should really get your hands on this and delve in. That's my review of it. 25 minutes long. I know it's a long book, but hey, it's a long review, but it's a long book. Read it. So guys, if you like it, click the like button, subscribe, share it, tell your friends, tell your enemies. And as always, I will see you in the next review.